So welcome to the workshop uh, about LinStore, um, more or less about software-defined storage based on DRBD, which I'll introduce in a minute. Uh, LinStore is a fairly new product, still in development. Uh, we haven't officially called it the alpha version, or beta version, or production version. I think our current version number is 0.9.8. Uh, uh, it's uh, about to come out uh, on the market. But it's already in, in production use in quite large installations, actually. Uh, while we're still developing new features, uh, extending functionality within the store, uh, introducing some things that were in the original design that have not yet been finished, so it's quite an interesting journey. I'll start by introducing uh, the company and myself, so you know where we come from, how it all started. So the company is called Limbit. It started around 2000, so it's almost been 20 years now. And it was originally focused on only one product. And the product is called DRBD. You might have heard about it. It has been a component of the Linux kernel for a very long time. It's an upstream kernel module, including uh, packages for user space utilities so that you can manage the kernel module. Uh, so whenever you download the Linux kernel, just the standard Linux kernel from kernel.org, or you just install a distribution like Ubuntu, Debian, Red Hat, uh, SUSE, whichever dist distribution you're using, you also get the DMD kernel module, multiple DMD, and you load it. Uh, those distributions still use DMD version 8, and I'll talk more about DMD version 9 which is what Linster is based on. So Linster does not work with DMD version 8. You'll have to upgrade to DMD version 9 to use it. And there are some interesting and uh, fundamental differences between the old DMD versions, like DMD up to version 8.4, and the new versions like uh, DMD version 9. So what does DMD do? Uh, DMD is a data replication product it replicates on a block level. So it doesn't really matter what kind of file system you have on top of your storage or whether you have a file system at all. You might just run some kind of product like a database directly on a block device. And you probably know that um, more or less everything on a Unix system, including Linux, <coughs> is a block device. So anything that is um, that provides storage is represented as a block device. You can see it in the dev file system, you know, those special files where it says uh, B as the first letter if you do a long listing that's a block device, as opposed to smaller devices like character devices, pipes, normal files, directories, things like that. So that's a file system object. And a hard disk, an SSD, even a USB stick, a CD-ROM, a cd ram all those things are uh, block devices, are represented as block devices, and DMD is as well. The difference is that DMD is a virtual block device. So um, it does not actually provide storage itself. It uses storage provided by other block devices and then replicates to another machine. So it more or less creates a radio between two machines. That's what DMD does. And that was for quite a long time, Limbit's only product. It started when Philip Eisner, who's the CEO of the company, he still is, and also one of the founders. Um, it started when he was at the university, so his master thesis was focused on DMD. And um, that was his suggestion, I think, by one of his professors. And he was not immediately interested in, in DMD or in replication in particular, but um, the more he thought about it, uh, the more he got the idea that it might be useful for a lot of things. So that's how the EVD started. Uh, very small, as an experimental project, uh, as a kernel model in Linux. And from there it grew and established itself. It went upstream uh, so that it is now part of the Linux kernel. 
Now, DBD9 is not yet its plan to make DBD9 go upstream as well, but that will take some time. And um, originally, DBD's role was in high availability. And now that the market is moving more towards software defined storage systems, uh, cloud systems, containerization, virtualization, that's where we started add-on products more or less to DOD to be able to manage complex setups automatically because DOD was something that you would probably use manually. Um, regarding Limbit, uh, we're based in Austria and we have a branch office in the United States and you heard that correctly, well it's the other way around. We have a company in the United States and they have a branch office here in Europe. But, um, Linden started in small Austria, in Vienna, with just a couple of people. We're still not a very large company. There are about 30 people who focus on <coughs> developing um, administration, um, operating, sales, marketing. So the entire company is only about 30, 35 people, most of which are in Vienna, and about um, 15 are in the United States. In uh, Portland in Oregon, there are two diff different Portlands. The uh, one uh, branch of this ad is the one at the, at the west coast of the United States. Lindit is still 100% founder owned, so there is no venture capital or anything behind it. Uh, no one is demanding, we probably heard the talk in the morning, no one is asking us to pay back all the money, so there's uh, a lot less pressure from that side. And we, we also have a partner in Japan, so that's why you see three limited logos there. And there are a lot of companies that work together with us around the world to provide support for DOD and also our new clients. Um, about myself, um, my story started actually quite a long time ago in the 90s. Um, I was quite fascinated by computers, and my father was a computer engineer. Uh, he worked for IBM back then. Uh, he was an assembler programmer originally for System 370 mainframes. Uh, and then later joined the AS400 division as a systems engineer. So I was fascinated by computers and visited my father in his office, watching him do magic things on computers, not really understanding what it does. He let me try it out, like type a nice text somewhere in the terminal. And uh, so I didn't really want to do my math homework, for example. I was like, why would you do it manually? We have computers, we can use computers to calculate things. Why don't you use that? Why do you have to study math in school? And that's when my father bought our first computer for at home. Uh, basically to teach me that everything is not that easy. You have to actually write a program and computers don't just deal with numbers magically, there are limits. Like they deal with the first 32 bits of the number. And then if you don't know how to use them properly, your results of calculations will be kind of funny. And um, so I started writing simple programs and my father had a new hobby breaking my programs. <laughs> so that's what got me interested in how to write reliable programs at a very early age. And I was still fascinated, so um, I was still like, I still don't want to do my math homework, I want to figure out how to do that problematically. So I guess his plan kind of backfired a little. But uh, that's what uh, got me into computers. Um, by the time I finished school, and I had started studying as well as software engineering, but I didn't finish, I, I typically dropped out. Um, I started a data center, uh, I joined a data center company in, in Vienna, started to work for Metropolitan Data Center, which is or was the data center for a quite large um, insurance company or a group of insurance companies actually. And coincidence um, led to the situation where IBM bought the entire company and suddenly I was working for IBM without ever having applied there. So that was kind of funny. 
I did a lot of support in uh, technical operations, some development, uh, different types of systems, so I'm not entirely Unix focused. We worked on mainframe systems as well, and even it is for Android. And um, later, I still was interested in how to write reliable software and how to create reliable systems. I joined the uh, root cause analysis team at IBM, which was more or less focused on figuring out why things go wrong, uh, much the same way as they do when aircraft crash, for example. And I'm also a very um, big fan of aviation, and I'm very interested in the aircraft, so that, that was a kind of nice opportunity to take. I left IBM in 2010 and joined SoftDirect, and that's when I uh, learned about DRBT, because SoftDirect was one of the users of DRBT. SoftDirect was a uh, software as a service company that provided ticket systems and ticket system bridges that bridged uh, between companies so that they could send tickets to each other, more or less, uh, some automated exchange systems. And uh, the servers um, were based on DLD for high availability reasons, so that if one server crashes, well, another one can take over. Uh, I worked for SoftDirect for about three years, uh, then SoftDirect was also bought by Cisco this time, and I left and joined Limbit. Um, and now I was basically at the source of DRD and high availability, which I was always interested in. So that's how I ended up working for Linden, where I work as a developer, and I'm also the lead developer for Linden Store. So I hope I can answer some of your more technical questions as well. So I asked about Linden and about uh, myself. Let's talk about how storage works. And before we go into how DVD works, what DVD does, what you can do with LinStore, let's see what was already there um, before we started LinStore. So one of our like, favorite components of uh, Linux is the logical volume manager. We use that a lot. We have used it before we had LinStore. Now we use it for automation. Because what it allows you to do is it allows you to create abstract and virtual storage pools. You can just take a number of physical devices like hard disks, SSDs, even NVMe storage, or any kind of block device that you can write and read from. Uh, and you can form a volume group using those physical devices. And once you have the volume group, this volume group appears as if it were one large physical device that you can partition. Those partitions are then called logical volumes. So you can create a logical volume that is just a tiny part of the storage that you have, just like the artist partition more or less. But you can also create a logical volume that is larger than any physical device that you have. So, for example, if you only have two terabyte disks, 10, 10 of them, and you have 20 terabytes of storage, but you can still create a 8 terabyte single volume that will just be spread over multiple physical devices. So it gives a lot of flexibility uh, storage-wise. Uh, logical Volume Manager was originally, that's a fun, funny thing um, because of my background in IBM, that was originally developed by IBM and used in the AIX operating system, which is a Unix-like operating system. And it's also a Unix clone, just like Linux. So it's not a system that is a direct fork of the unit source code or of BSD, neither BSD nor System 5, it's a clone and it's written from scratch just like Linux. And Linux LVM has the same name and it basically works the same way except the commands are different, the names of the commands are different, the syntax is different, but it is not a copy or it is not a code contribution from, from IBM, so it's just the same idea we implemented. So it's a different implementation. Uh, it has different commands, but it does the same thing and follows the same idea. As you can see, it's uh, based on device mapper. Uh, that's why I can find it on password dm, dm0, dm1, dm2, and there are nice links, uh, uh, symbolic links that uh, tell you what the actual name is that you chose when creating the logical volume. So you can do dev slash um, volume group name slash 
uh, lottery volume name and you find the volume that you created. Uh, so yeah, physical volumes, volume groups, logical volumes, snapshots, you can do snapshots of volumes and you can use those snapshots as volumes as well. So you can basically mount the snapshot, modify it, create another snapshot, delete the volume, it's just another volume. And you can also do thin provisioning, uh, if you've never heard about that, it means that you, do, you don't actually have all the storage that you pretend you have. You can create a 100 terabyte volume and it will appear to have 100 terabytes of memory, although you only have 20 terabytes worth of disk. You don't really have the storage. It is only allocated as soon as you write to it. If you read from a location somewhere that is not allocated, all you get back is just zeros. So thin provision basically pretends that a device is empty when you create it, it only contains zeros. And once you write to a certain location, that's where you get actual storage allocated. That has some advantages. For example, with snapshots, you can share some portions of the disk. If you have 10 snapshots of the same volume, it doesn't take 10 times the storage space of the original volume. So if you have a one terabyte volume and you have 10 snapshots with fat provisioning, that basically takes 11 terabytes of memory. But with thin provisioning, it only takes one terabyte, and then whatever modifications you have in every snapshot. But it is also somewhat risky because the system is pretending to have storage that is not actually there. So once you run into the limit of what your actual storage is in the volume group, that might get a little nasty because then your I.O. blocks and you have to figure out how to get more storage uh, in your volume group quite quickly <laughs> because otherwise you're stuck. Now it looks basically like that. Uh, thin provision works by creating a logical volume that you use as a thin pool and all the logical volumes that you create on top of that thin pool use only the storage that is available in that single thin pool logical volume. So it's kind of another logical volume stacked on top of an existing logical volume with this with thin provision in the middle. Uh, then another feature that is already available in Linux is RAID. It's called MD multiple devices. There is an MD ADM command uh, that you use for configuring RAID. And it's capable of doing different RAID levels and it is all software controlled. So it doesn't require RAID hardware. It's just a driver, uh, another kernel module in the system that um, simulates hardware more or less. It, you can use it for striping RAID 0. You can do mirroring RAID 1, which is kind of similar to what DRT does. Um, and you can do different RAID levels using erasure code, like RAID 5, RAID 6. And you can combine them. You can do RAID 1, 0, for example, which is striping as well as mirroring. So you have two mirrors of the striped um, setup. And there is another comment here that DM RAID is something different. So it has nothing to do with DM RAID. One more component that is available in Linux is caching. And the idea behind that is that you have some rather slow storage, hard disks, that is cheap and large. But as a, uh, as a performance optimization, you have the possibility to add some SSDs which are a lot faster than hard disk in between. So the SSDs are smaller than the hard disks, they can't cover everything. But everything that is used very frequently can be cached on those SSDs. And there are two different um, technologies available in Linux. One is DM cache and the other one is B cache. Uh, they're similar, they do similar things. B cache is somewhat ahead performance wise. And there's some there's been some recent development. Uh, so if you look into those two technologies, um, there are quite a few changes still going on. Um, there's a lot of development still being actively done in both of those. And obviously that's one component that we might use in software defined storage systems to 
exaggerated access to data that is often used. And then there is deduplication. Uh, so that's basically saving storage in a way quite similar to thin provisioning. Uh, you're trying to link uh, a file, for example, to the same blocks if the content is the same, avoiding duplication of content. So it's another layer of a virtual block device that allows you to use deduplicated backends. As soon as you write, for example, there are two files pointing to the same data, as soon as you change one of them, then it will create a copy that is a modification of the original content. But only those blocks will change where there's actually something different in those blocks. So it's kind of similar to thin provision. And that is also going upstream quite soon, that is a preparation. It's another uh, kernel module, it's integrated with the device mapper module. Uh, obviously it's often used with LVM and it's recommended to be used below LVM, so the physical volume layer rather than at the logical uh, level. Uh, the actual indexing service is not running in the kernel, it's running in user space. Um, now we're seeing a basically a graph that shows an initiative and the target of a, a ice CASI initiative. It's not like still on, I think it is. Um, DRD is somewhat similar, we'll see that in a few slides. So ice CASI is a transport where you basically pretend that you have a SCSI device locally that you don't have locally. It's actually on a different system. And as the initiator, that's more or less the client, you're sending I.O. requests to some server, that's the target, and then you get data and completion requests if it's a write request, that's what you get back. And there are different technologies and limits already available. One of them, as you can see, is written in bold letters here, it's LIO. That's the one that, that's, that's the choice today, that's the one that you normally use. There are some other ones that have mostly historical um, importance, but um, what we're talking about today is mostly LIO. And there's a different kind of target and initiate as well, and that's rather new. That's all the non volatile memory NVMe, non volatile memory express, and OF means over fabrics. So that basically means uh, through the network. And that works pretty much the same way. You have an initiator, which is a client, and you have a target where you get your actual data from and where you're actually writing to. And finally, CFS on Linux is also something that exists. Uh, although, you know, there's some dispute about the licensing because it's not on the GPL, I think it's on the CDDL that was originally developed by Sun Microsystems, which also doesn't exist anymore because it was bought by Oracle. Uh, CFS is a very powerful file system with 128 bits addressing um, and it can do pretty much, pretty much the same things as LVM as well as some additional things that LVM can't do like caching, uh, integrated caching um, even on the file system level uh, it can do thin provisioning it can do kind of logical volumes it can either do logical file systems or it can do logical block devices a lot of a C pool, it has different RAID levels, it can do a lot of things, but uh, due to the licensing, licensing issues, currently it's only uh, in the Ubuntu distributions. Might be in a few less uh, popular ones as well, I'm not absolutely sure about that, but from the well known large distributions, the only ones that actually has packages and comes with the CFS and the kernel is Ubuntu at the time. Obviously you could just um, compile it yourself on any other distribution if you want, so because you know you don't have to use the distribution kernel and you don't have to use only the packages that each distribution includes, but then you basically have to manage all the CFS parts yourself distribution won't do it for you. So it's still an option. Yeah? 
there's also a dairy package that just works, but the uh, Ubuntu file is in the zero point and it's on the root file. System. I think uh, so. There are two distributions that also allow you to do that. One is Arctic, and the other one is Gentoo, but they're both sort of a rolling upgrade source installed distribution, so it's yeah. hard to do. Uh, so, what we just heard, I'm just repeating so it's not a video. Um, it's also in, in Arch Linux and uh, yeah, Gen2. And there's a package in Debian. And there's a, pa a Debian package as well. But it compiles a kernel module. And it compiles a kernel module. So, uh, in Ubuntu, you have it included in distribution. You can even have a root file just to it, but there are a couple other distributions where you can at least install it as an option. Uh, and that is also supported by Linsta, by the way. We'll talk a bit more about that uh, in a few minutes. And you finally arrive at EMPD. It was a bit too quick. So if you think of DMD as a RAID 1, then you're close to what it actually does. You can think of it as a RAID 1 over network. It's very similar to that. So, for example, if you think about a RAID 1 and an ISCASI and that combined, then you could say on the client or on the primary, the one that actually works with the data, the initiator, is forming a RAID 1 with your local hard disks. And that goes through the network to the target. That's where your actual storage is. So where all the data ends up when you write and where the data comes from when you read. On the target, the target forms a RAID 1 with the local disks. So on the next slide, you see basically the same thing but with DVD's architecture and there is no ISCAS involved here so that's just a thought experiment more or less to describe what DVD does but from the principle it's very similar in DVD you have at least one primary node that's the one where your application runs where you use your DVD device to write data onto the DVD device or to read data from the DVD device and normally you have a local disk and you also have a remote system that also runs DVD, that's the secondary and that one also has a local disk and what happens when your application writes to the primary node is that it writes to the local disk and in parallel it also informs the remote node, the secondary, about the changes and the secondary writes to its local disk and then it confirms to the primary that the changes have been written to the disk so that when DOD returns to your application, your application can be sure that all changes have been written to the disks on the local system and on the remote system. So it's a completely synchronous replication in the default mode. You can change that and use DOD in an asynchronous mode as well, where it does not wait for the remote system to confirm write requests before it returns to the application. That is mostly used for long distance replication and obviously it's less safe than the synchronous mode. And then, as you can see, we have a kind of blue disk here. Uh, the primary does not necessarily have to have a disk. Historically, it had one because DMD8 was limited to exactly two nodes. So, both systems had a disk for replication for high availability. But with DVD 9, there can be up to 32 nodes that provide the same volume and the same resource. And not every one of them has to have local storage. So it's much closer to something like iSCSI than DVD 8. In DVD 8, the only case where you had no local disk was when it had failed. That was always some kind of error. In DVD 9, it can be an, an, an intentional configuration. For example, you could have three storage systems and three clients. And each of the clients has access to whatever is on the storage systems, but none of the clients has local storage. It all works by sending data and requests through the network. And there's also a possibility to create consistent, uh, consistency groups. So in DOBD, we don't only think about volumes, we think in terms of resources. One resource in most configurations is a single volume. 
but it's also possible to have one resource with multiple volumes. And all those volumes share a single replication link and they're all synchronized. So for example, it's not possible to write to, uh, to one volume of the same resource on one node and to another volume of the same resource on another node. That doesn't happen. And also if replication stops, it stops at the same time on all of the volumes of one resource. Uh, that is mostly used, for example, if you have a database and you have database data, <coughs> database log on different volumes, you would always like to have them in a consistent state. So when replication of the log stops, uh, replication of the actual data should stop at the same point. That's the idea behind consistency groups. And that's why we don't just use or don't just think about volumes or only think about uh, resources. Yes. Um, would it be uh, only failover then? If you describe it like this? I know low ends of the community, but uh, um, two ways. Uh, replication, uh, there is a load balancing involved, um, so that's another effect. It's more or less a side effect of how PD works. A convenient one because it makes reading faster. So if you have one storage node and multiple uh, secondaries, um, actually multiple storage nodes, but one of them is active and that one node reads data from the storage and the local storage is already saturated so it cannot provide more I.O. then it will also ask remote nodes to provide some more data at the same time so there's some load plans in, involved but the original idea was not for load plans it was for high availability so that if you lose one of those systems and uh, I mean, the typical case for losing is a temporary one where you have a power failure or something like that. So it's it's offline. Another one will promote and provide the service and have the same data. So it stops exactly where the other one stopped. And then you have the same data. You can continue. And when the first system, the one that crashed, starts up again, it will resynchronize automatically so that they have the same state again. And the other scenario, scenario that DOD prevents or that protects, it, protects you from is where you lose data permanently because, for example, one of the systems lost due to some case of a disaster like a fire or destruction of a site or something like that. Because since you're replicating the data and all of it like a RAID 1, you have only lost one copy of it, but you have a lot of them. In DVD-8's case, in DVD-9, you might even have two or three other copies of it. Depends on how much money you want to throw at it, basically. Because obviously, you would need like two or three times the storage space for that. But it's possible. And so I already mentioned that up to 32 replicas per resource. You can create multiple resources. And then obviously you could create larger systems than that because one of your resources can be connected to 31 other nodes on this side and another resource on the same system can be connected to another 31 other nodes on another side. So, um, will it, will it you can create very large setups with that. Will it, uh, the, the, the white weight still is restricted to all 32 or only uh, to one other one? Yes, yeah, so the question is whether the DOD waits until that the primary has written to all secondaries or only to one secondary and the answer is straightforward it waits for all of them so it's really simple to watch all secondaries um, there are some more details about that if the primary suddenly disappears then some secondaries might have gotten data that others didn't and then they re resynchronize as well it's called a reconciliation using that's a bit too much in detail for today because we only have that much time, but it's an interesting detail. And you also uh, split the data to uh, replicate the secondary disk so that on one secondary you have other uh, kind of data on that store. Okay. So that another secondary That's sharding. Um, so the question is whether you can split the data among the secondaries, basically you shard data in different parts and I guess the question is basically about erasure coding like RAID 5 and RAID 6 
that is not yet the feature of DVD, but it is an ongoing project. And it's actually in the slides at a somewhat later point in time, so we'll hear about that as well. So uh, the short answer basically is no, you can't, but you will be able in some time. <laughs> there is no strict road that has to be done. will be finished, but it's, uh, it's being worked on. So this was note. Uh, I mentioned that um, with DVD 8, the only case was the failed disk. With DVD 9, you can still have a failed disk and it will still work on the primary because it uses the secondary disks remotely. But you can also have an intentional disk less configuration. That is where you have a DVD 9 client that doesn't have local storage, it just uses remote storage, similar to a high schedule. Some more details about DOD. Um, so DOD nodes know what the version of the data is that they expose. Uh, normally they will call themselves up to date if they have the newest version of the data. But then one system might stop replication for whatever reason, either because there is a power outage or because the replication link has disconnected. And in that case, obviously another system will take over and change the data subsequently. So it will generate a new generation based on the generation of data that the stopped node has. And once those two nodes reconnect, they will able to figure out that the data on one of the nodes is newer than the data on the node that was behind for reasons of power outage or replication failure. And then they can automatically figure out how to resynchronize the data. So it figures out which direction to do a resync, and it can do that um, without doing a full synchronization. So it doesn't copy all the data, it only copies the changes. Um, that's the line where it says automatic partial resync after connection outage, for example. And the same is true for power outage. There are some addition. Yes? It will take a long time when you have to re-synchronize your business. In the meantime, are they also usable at that moment? So the question is about uh, how long it takes to resynchronize and uh, whether the DVD is usable while it resynchronizes. Um, how, long, how long it takes to resynchronize depends on how much data there is on the disk and how fast the replication link and storage backend is. So there are a lot of variables behind that, but in general it's close to the native speed of the system normally. And um, a DVD node that is in the process of resynchronizing is usable as a primary node as long as the network connection is active. So any DVD node that is not up to date, that does not have all the data locally, can still be used to read and write data uh, as long as it is connected to another node that has up to date data. So the entire network normally would all of the nodes are connected to each other and there is at least one node that has all the data then every other node will work. And there are some other details like script writing detections or that happens whenever you disconnect nodes from each other and then you make different changes to different nodes which obviously is a bad idea because then you have different forks of the data it will detect that and will refuse to resynchronize automatically so to avoid uh, creating a chaos from your data. And you can, um, you can resolve split brains manually by choosing which one of the nodes has correct data. And even split brain recovery is done in an incremental way. It does not require a full copy of the data, a full resync. It can do an incremental resync. Fencing is obviously an interesting topic. Um, so fencing, that's what takes place when you have a cluster of multiple systems, four or five systems. One of them fails, or the network connection to the system fails. The other systems can't figure out which one of those two happens. So well, the other systems don't know whether the network connection failed and the system is actually still working and running applications, or whether the system actually stopped and doesn't run any applications anymore. So what fencing does is it uses an alternate network path to basically turn off power. Because if you turn the system off, if it doesn't have any power anymore, then you can be certain 
that is that it isn't running any applications anymore. And DoD supports fencing in combination with cluster resource managers like Pacemaker and Corson. Corson is the communication layer for Pacemaker, so that DoD can detect when its replication link fails and tell the cluster not to fail over to a system that has lost access to the most up-to-date data. And can you tell the cluster resource manager to fence the system completely, so basically to turn it off, not let it fence it. There's also a core mechanism in DoD, so that systems that cannot reach at least 50% of the cluster, for example, if you have five systems, that means you need to be able to reach three systems. Three systems need to be part of the cluster for DoD to make available any data. That is another mechanism that is meant to prevent split brain situations. Because only the larger partition of the cluster can write and can make changes to the data. So if the cluster splits and the systems that were lost are not actually stopped, they are still running, then they will detect that they have lost access to the larger part of the cluster and will refuse to make any more changes to the data. Um, with DoD you can do quite a big number of resources and the, the actual limit depends on how many volumes you have per resource. There's not really a limit on the number of resources. Resources are named. Each resource has, normally has at least one volume. Technically you can actually create resources that do not have any volumes but it doesn't make a whole lot of sense to do that. <laughs> so normally you at least have one volume. And the Linux limitation or basic limitation of virtually every Linux system is that a single driver can have up to 1 million minor block devices, minor numbers, uh, 1 million and so on. Um, 2 to the power of 20 minus 1 is the maximum minor number. So uh, that's what effectively limits the, the maximum number of resources. And you can have multiple volumes per resource up to 65,534 in DVD. Uh, no one has ever done that as far as I know, but it's possible. So in that case, you can divide what the actual maximum number of resources is if you use the maximum number of uh, volumes per resource for every resource. That's how that works. And then finally, there's also dual primary mode in DVD where you can write to the same block device for multiple nodes at the same time. And multiple nodes as of now is limited to a maximum of two nodes. And in DVD 9, uh, it's only supported for live migration of virtual machines, because we know exactly how that works. And um, to two node setups where you only have two storage nodes. Because um, if you have multiple storage nodes, that is not very well tested, so we are not sure that it works with three or four or five nodes in dual primary mode. Um, dual primary mode was available in DVD 8 as well. It's quite well established there, and it also works in two, uh, two primary modes, only two primaries, not three or four. Um, some roadmap information about DVD. Obviously, there's some metadata for DVD that it requires to figure out um, what the data is that is the same on all of the nodes and what some data is that has been changed on a single node but not on the others. It's called a bitmap. And metadata is about a 32,000th of the actual data size, so it's quite small. But some part of it is performance critical, and that's why we think about. Uh, putting metadata on persistent memory, PMEM, NVDs, very fast uh, storage systems in the future. And we're working actively on supporting that. Uh, there's a serial copy receive module for DMD, it's called RDMA, Remote Direct Memory Access. It's available, for example, on InfiniBand links. over converged Ethernet as well, it's called ROTI, RDMA, over converged Ethernet. And there are some other improvements being made to DVD as well, like reducing the number of context switches that are required um, for DVD to do its work, sending data, receiving data, things like that. 
And um, that's where it says numerous stars grant DMT for cloud related to your question before uh, er erasure coding, so something like grade 5, grade 6. That is being worked on and this is a, a new funded project uh, together with a couple of other companies, AIT and um, Pro um, Procipi from Czech Republic. So we are working on introducing erasure coding as well at DMT. Uh, a prototype is already able, of, uh, able to distribute data in that way. So one of our developers has started working on the actual implementation details in DOPD in the current module uh, some time ago, and we do have a working prototype, but it's not yet out in the open and not yet ready for production, but it's been working. And long distance replication, obviously, there is a an additional product which is called Unit Proxy that allows long distance replication of the slow links. And then there is even WinDMD. So WinDMD, that actually started as an April Fool stage show. So some time ago, many years ago, someone wrote an April Fool's Day article saying DMD is being ported to Windows now. And it was really just a joke. No one anticipated that that would actually uh, happen someday. But uh, there was a South Korean company that um, started doing basically a fork of DMD that were run on Windows. And then they contacted us and asked for a partnership, more or less. So um, that's how WinDMD started. And there's a beta version of it out in the public. One of our developers is working on it, and <laughs> you can actually download WinDMD. So we're probably one of the few companies that turned an April Fool's Day joke into an actual product. WinDMD is no longer a joke that actually exists. Uh, public beta runs on Windows 7, Windows 10, Windows 7, 2016. It is compatible with the Linux version, so you can hook up the Linux machine to the Windows machine and replicate both directions. Um, it is still uh, based on the Linux version, so there's a compatibility layer in Windows that basically turns the Linux kernel model or most of it into a Windows driver so that we can we don't have to copy paste all the code, we can just commit it to the Linux version and then the, the Windows build process takes what the Linux version has and applies it to the to the Windows driver model. So it tracks the Linux version with only one day release of technology. And the ring DVD user level tools are also integrated with the Linux uh, user level tools, the so-called DVD tools. So it's really the same package in that case. It was a short uh, ring DVD. Can I ask a question? Yes. What's the use case for that? What's the use case for ring DVD? Uh, that's a good question. Uh, there are some products in Windows that allow replication. There are some uh, application-specific ones, I think, for Exchange. And Microsoft SQL Server obviously has its own replication, but very database-centric. It doesn't replicate block devices. And there is, as far as I know, also Microsoft technology that is able to do block-level replication in Windows Server, at least Enterprise Edition. But there's not really some open source product like DVD available on Windows and I guess that's the use case when you are looking for an open source alternative to replicating block devices on Windows. And apart from that, the use case is pretty similar, either high availability or some kind of cloud system. Can you replicate from WinDRB to normal DVD? Uh, so the question is whether you can replicate from WinDVD to normal DVD, and yes, you can do that, even across different architectures. Uh, so on the Linux side, um, DVD, probably also on the Windows side, I haven't tried yet, but on the Linux side, DVD is architecture neutral. You can run it, and most people do that, on just coming off the shelf x86, IA32, or AMD6400. But you can also run it on ARM hardware or Spark or Power or PA Risk. And people have actually done that. It's quite widespread. And some of them are big Indian, others are little Indian architectures. You can mix even those because the wire protocol is always a big Indian. 
So work uh, being done on wind EMDs um, will get the ability to boot from drive C. Um, we're working on locking primitives because those are different than Windows as compared to Linux. Linux uses a lot of RCU read copy update mechanisms. And the RCU mechanism in Linux uh, is mostly also effective when you have like the most distribution standard kernels a non-preemptive Linux kernel, which doesn't really exist in Windows NT because the NT kernel is always preempting. And in Linux that's a option that you can change. Uh, the mo most distribution kernels are non-preemptive and then you can change the kernel configuration when you compile the kernel to either voluntary preemption or normal preemption model. And when you're having a kernel that's um, preempting processes in kernel mode, then RCU is less effective. Um, obviously the kernel uh, has lower latency and things like that, um, and better read time capabilities if you have a preemptive kernel. So there are kind of different um, advantages to both models. Uh, and that's an interesting difference between different operating systems, by the way. Uh, some kernels are preemptive, others are non-preemptive, some can be configured to do one or the other. Uh, Linux is one of those that can be configured. And um, many other Unix traditionally used to be non-preemptive, and many systems have added it, like AIX and various other preemptive systems. FreeBSD has added preemption. I don't know exactly what the other ones. macOS is preemptive. So that's an interesting detail to look at if you're interested in operating system technology. And then finally, LinStore. So what is LinStore? Where does LinStore come in? I'll show you real quick how to configure um, DMD and then it'll make uh, some more sense. So let's fire up the terminal. I hope it's still connected. Yes, it's it is. So normally when you're using DMD you have a couple of configuration files. Um, DMD.conf uh, that used to be the only configuration file by now it's only a collection of include statements. And if you look into the DMD.d directory that's where you normally have your configuration files. There are a couple of tests. This is one of our test systems, by the way. And um, by now, we only also have um, configuration files that are automatically created, and that's what it's all about. And so, this is what a configuration file looks like it declares a resource that is called database. You can actually see it over here. It's a database resource. It has one volume with a certain size. Um, volume number one, minor number one thousand five. Uh, it actually has two volumes. Volume zero, uh, one thousand four, and one thousand five. So those are the minor numbers. So you can see that in the configuration, there is a network configuration for it. There's an authentication secret defined. There are two nodes that have the resource. Uh, both of them have two volumes. Both of those use an LV. Um, your volume from LVM, so you can find it here. It's actually two because we have two volumes. One is two gigabytes, the other one is one gigabyte. Uses internal metadata, so the metadata is on the same backend volume as the actual data. And then there's a network configuration that tells DOD which systems to connect. That's an IP version 6 link from one system to the other system, TCP IP. Simple uh, TCP IP connection with a DMD more or less proprietary protocol. Um, so that's that's the data link. And that's what you normally do. Um, traditionally, as a DMD administrator, or a DMD, especially a DMD 8, uh, you walk up to your system and you type in a configuration file, put it into the etc DMD directory where you have your other configuration files, then you copy the configuration file to another system and uh, then you can start using DMD. 
I'll just do that real quick with a sample resource. So normally go, let's see what the volume groups are. So there's a volume group called DMD pool. Then you create a logical volume that's called maybe something like demo. And you specify a size, maybe a gigabyte, on the volume group DMD pool. And you have to do that on both nodes. One gigabyte on DMD pool. And then you can create the DMD resource. So you go EI to see DMD with D, demo address, resource, demo. Volume zero. This DMD pool, that's where it ends up. Demo. Make this internal metadata device mylar. I'll use a mile number that I probably didn't use so far, 19777. And then you go those two node names, the ones are called power and open. Kind of the names. You need node IDs and DNA line. You need the replication link. So I'll use one of those infinite pad links here. Uh, 172, And you have to specify the port number. Let's do 9777. I hope I haven't used that already. And you could do IP version 4. Here if you want. Node ID 1, address IP version 4, 1718. And then you could also add some authentication network settings and stuff like that. I'll skip that for the printing. Deleting top templates, so I can actually read that. So no syntax error in there. So it's there, it's still inconsistent, volumes are attached, there's a connection between the two systems, and now I can choose one inside to start either doing the full sync or I can skip the full sync uh, since there's no data on it yet. It doesn't really matter. I do a full sync so you'll see that as well. Primary force um, demo. And now it starts the full sync of that one gigabyte device. And once that is done, both should be in up-to-date mode and you have a DMD device that you can actually use. So you basically go, tell us if DMD, what's there. Um, there's demo. Um, that's a DMD pool. This is my device with my number 19,777. Let's try to create a file just on top of that. DMD. I'm not sure whether this card is supported here or the moon is card as well. And then you can mount the FDMD 9777. And let's put some data on it. Sync. So we have a primary node over here. This is the primary, this is the secondary. That happens automatically in DVD9 as soon as I mount this, uh, the device, it goes into primary mode. And then when I unmount again, 
also, now it doesn't go back all the way because I set the primary manually and it still remembers that. So I have to manually. Now if I mount FTV, now it's automatic if I unmount again, it goes back to secondary. And then obviously I can mount here the FTV to AMT and I should probably have my data here. That's what I copied onto the AMT device or the binaries from B. So that's what you traditionally do when you use the AMT. The question is what do you do when you do not have two nodes in your cluster but you're maybe a cloud provider or a Kubernetes user with a large cluster and you have 110 nodes. Are you going to write configuration files for 700 resources that are distributed over 110 nodes. Some of them are on um, six of your nodes, other resources may, might be on 10 of your nodes, another resource might be on 10 other nodes, and then you change the setup at some point. Maybe, maybe you move one resource from one node to another node. So it, it, it gets kind of tricky because your minor numbers are not supposed to collide. Your TCP IP port numbers are not supposed to collide. You're supposed to know all your network links because those systems might be different subnets. They might, might use, obviously they use different IP addresses. So there are lots of things to keep in mind. You we'll have to create the backend storage like I just did. Um, that's a bit much to do if you have a large cluster. That's where LinStore um, becomes interesting. So let's see what the LinStore thing is. So the goals for LinStore were to create an orchestration system that automatically manages DOD resources. That was the original goal. Uh, in the beginning, it was meant to manage only the DOD resources. By now, it manages much more than that. So it's not only focused on DOD anymore. Um, what we had in mind originally was OpenStack and similar systems, virtualization environments, and then later we also uh, created connectors for Kubernetes, Open Nebula. Um, there are talks about um, integrating it into Xen and VMware as well, depending on how that works um, and what the uh, vendors of those products enable us to do. Um, it was meant to build on existing Linux storage components, the ones that I mentioned in the beginning. It was meant to be multi-user capable so that it could have like, different tenants, some people having access to certain resources, some other people having access to their resources, even on different levels of security. And if you only have a test set up, you can turn off all the security, and anyone who can log in can change everything, then on the one level higher, basically have access control lists to control who can do what, and then even one level higher, you have mandatory access controls that are pre-configured by the Linux administrator, and you have different um, administrators from all these different domains that can't interfere even if they change the access control lists on their objects. And uh, it was supposed to support different models of um, deploying resources, uh, namely the ones where you have storage nodes and clients that use the storage. So a film called it disaggregated in the slides. So a split system, you have some consumers, you have some producers, more and then these so-called hyper-converged systems where the systems that run the actual applications also have storage built into the system instead of accessing the storage system remotely. And it was supposed to support different kinds of backends. In the beginning, that was just LVM, ThinLVM, and CFS. CFS can also do fact and thin provision, by the way. And by now, we can also do uh, NVMe uh, storage, um, Swerd Fish targets. So, Swerd Fish is more or less a manager for remote storage, only NVMe storage. And obviously one of our goals also was to create an open source product and it's all under the GPL, you can find it on GitHub. And that is something that, uh, that you don't get from most other vendors, like um, 
you can buy a soft and flat storage system from EMC, Dell, um, you can buy it from HP, you can buy it from IBM, you can buy it from a whole couple of companies, even Cisco, I think, actually. But it's not that easy to find one where you can actually look into the code or fork the code and do something with it or integrate, integrate into the because you can find all the details. So what can you do with Lens Store? There are different setups. This is the one where you have this aggregated stack. So we have a couple of hypervisors. It was our original idea. We got a virtualization. There is a number of hypervisors. Those hypervisors are running virtual machines. Those virtual machines need some kind of storage. And then there are other servers that are storage nodes that provide that storage. And since I told you about DFD not necessarily requiring a local disk, you don't really need IceCase or anything like that. You can use DFD directly and create a DFD client volume. So the hypervisor doesn't really have storage, but it has a DFD uh, block device. And that connects remotely to the storage nodes that have the actual storage. And more or less magically, you have um, a storage device below your virtual machine that replicates to your storage nodes. So whenever your virtual machine needs to run somewhere else, so this happens, all you have to do is move the DVD client, the DVD block device that doesn't really have any local data, to another hypervisor. And you can still run the same virtual machine with the last state and the last generation of your data. So basically it stops here, it stops replicating, you shut down the virtual machine, or maybe the hypervisor crashes, whatever. And then you can restart and continue with the data that you had the last time. And it still accesses the same storage nodes. A different scenario is when one of your storage nodes fails. You don't really notice that because it's always connected to all the storage nodes. That's called a full mesh. So every client is connected to every storage node. If one of the storage nodes fails, then we'll just use another one that's completely transparent. You don't have to do anything. The only thing you will see is a missing node in the monitor that says the connection has been lost to this node. And then you have the hyperconverged scenario that's a bit more complicated, where you have hypervisors and storage integrated. So every one of your hypervisors, and the same is true for Kubernetes, for example, has its own storage locally, and it is replicated. It's not only stored locally, it's replicated to 2, 3, 4, whichever number of hypervisors you, you like, up to 32. So you have a copy somewhere else. If your hypervisor dies for whatever reason and is unavailable, there are still other hypervisors combined with storage that have a copy of the data. So let's assume the hypervisor on the top left is lost for whatever reason, or the VM is just moved somewhere else. Then you have two possibilities. You can either still use the DVD client and run the virtual machine somewhere where the local data is not available by just using the network and accessing the other hypervisors to provide the data remotely using the DVD9 client. And even while you're doing that, you also have the possibility to add another replica. So in this, in this case, we had two copies of the data. Now we're adding a third copy, and we're doing a full resync. So it will copy all the data from the other two storage nodes, the other two hypervisors, hyperconverged storage nodes, and integrate a new copy of the data so that you have the data locally wherever your virtual machine is running now. So you're migrating the data from an existing system where you already have the data to a system where you do not have the data locally, for example, to improve read performance because you have it locally and you don't have to ask another system to provide the data. And once the recent is finished, you can obviously remove unnecessary replicas. So you can migrate your data from one node to another node. You can move data around to and you don't, you don't ever lose your redundancy. Like if you have a three times redundant system, you can temporarily add a fourth uh, copy. So you have, you have four times redundant, quadruple redundant for a short amount of time until the reason is finished. And then you remove one of the replicas from one of the systems where it had been originally. 
That's the idea of moving data around. Um, regarding the architecture of Linstor, I have to add that Linstor was not our first attempt to create a system like that. Uh, because the idea, like if you look at all those things, what does Linstor do? It automates everything. It allocates TCP IP numbers for you, avoiding collisions in your cluster. Uh, it knows about the unknowns. I should probably show you some examples. Um, Um, so that, that is Linstor, my connection broke, oh, that's not nice. Uh, unfortunately I lost the network connection. At least I didn't notice that it went down. Support numbers automatically. You have to say things for volume definitions. You can even ask it what the status currently is. So, currently, it knows about all those systems. One of them is intentional at this class here. So, Linstore manages all the DVD resources for you. And creating a new one is quite easy. You do, for example, what is this definition create? Um, let's call it uh, a loop. One definition create for any loop. One gigabyte. So that's the first one. One definition list. Here it is. And then you can tell it either to automatically place it on a number of nodes, or you can just uh, choose it manually, which I'll do in that case. Most nodes are offline. You can choose a storage pool. So you can have, for example, a pool of fast NVMe drives, another pool of SSD drives, another pool of Hard disks that are very large are very, but also very slow, depending on what the resource is for. Is it an archive resource? Is it a high performance database resource? You can choose the storage pool and then you choose a number of nodes and you put the resource there. And that actually, it's not even case sensitive, so you can just rewrite any way you want. And there you go, there's your resource. So, all the steps that I did before thinking about which numbers to allocate, creating a logical volume on the logical volume manager on both nodes, uh, writing resource configuration files, putting the resource configuration files on the systems, running the DADM commands to create metadata, uh, resynchronizing the resource, all those things are done automatically in the link store, which makes it a lot easier to create resources. It's almost like you type a couple of commands and you're done. And obviously, normally, that's not even how you use the system. Uh, in most cases, you would um, do that uh, by plugging Linstore into a system like Kubernetes or a system like Open Nebula or OpenStack. Some of them have graphical user interfaces. So all you do is basically create new virtual machine, two volumes, 150 gigabytes, 120 gigabytes, and you have a profile stored somewhere that says every virtual machine has to be triple redundant. And then what happens is that Open Nebula tells Linstor to create 50 gigabytes of storage, and that's what happens in the background. You get your 50 gigabytes of storage locally, and you get two copies somewhere. 
That's the idea behind the in-store. Automation of um, storage. And as I said, um, it was not our first attempt, to be honest. We had a system that was called DVD Manage. And DVD Manage was just a script, quite a large one, about 20,000 lines of code written in Python, um, that used DVD 9 as a replication data store, is just as a JSON store, and used DBus to communicate with a client software, just like a Linux store client, command line utility. And um, it was multi master um, and uh, basically just did what Linster does now. Allocate numbers, create logic volumes, create metadata, start up DFD. Sounds easy. Sounds as if you can script it. Um, and we learned the hard way that you, you can't do it that easily. And the reason for that is that the entire environment around it is not as reliable as it seems when you're using it manually. So for example, if, when, when I created my DVD resource, I did LV create and I got a logical volume. Then I wrote my configuration file, that's the easy part. Then I ran DVD and create MD and then I ran DVD and start up, start up a resource. What actually happens is when you automate those things, you get lots of race conditions because the entire backend, starting with Linux volume management, NVM, the UDEV demo that creates your block device um, files and all those things. None of that is designed for reliable automation. So what happens when the LV create is that you might not get your block device immediately. The command finishes, but you still don't have your block device. And then your next automation step is already trying to create metadata on a device that the system told you is there, but it really isn't there. And that's what one of our problems in DVD Manage was uh, reliability. Uh, it had far too many errors. The errors were hard to track. Also, programmers are not perfect, and we ran into a lot of runtime errors um, with Python. And scalability was another problem. It was single threaded, it even ran every Single storage nodes one after another. So one of them deployed the volume, then the next of them deployed the volume, and so on. Uh, so there are lots of limitations in TVD Manager. Linster actually started as a rogue project. It was not something where the company said, let's design a new product. It was something we had three different prototypes written by different developers, basically in their spare time, and then we more or less suggested to replace TVD Manager completely and we designed it completely from the ground up and that's how we ended up uh, designing and implementing Linster. Linster is radically different from DVD Manage and it is even radically different from traditional methods. Like DVD Manage had basically configuration files. You would use VI to configure some configuration files. It deployed on systems manually more or less. Um, it ran an external command which is called the system in the shell. So Linster is very, very different in radical ways. It doesn't use debus due to lots of timeout problems we had with that. Uh, it uses its own TCP IP protocol uh, between, up until now between all components from the client to the controller and also from the controller to the satellite. Uh, it's written in Java now which is a somewhat um, disputed decision. Every time we mention Java and Unix world, people are somewhat skeptical. Um, uh, we had our reasons to do that, and I'm happy to explain technical details afterwards because many of the decisions we took with Linster are kind of controversial. Uh, for example, the next one, it uses an SQL database. It doesn't use flat files, it uses a structured database with constraints and um, it also uses in-memory transactions so it basically has some kind of in-memory database as well that is normally embedded in the store so we're using an embedded database that you don't have to administrate yourself you don't really see it but you have the option of using a centralized one um, the, I think two databases two centralized ones that are currently supported are PostgreSQL and DB2 um, 
So that's a kind of controversial decision, and also it doesn't really have a lot of configuration files, just a minimum. One that tells us where the database is, and then the satellite nodes, uh, one that tells us where to listen, which, which network interface to listen on. And everything else comes from the controller for the database. So we have very much centralized the configuration in LinStore itself. It doesn't really require you to change any configuration files. What's also new is there's just a single controller. It might be on the multiple nodes, it might be installed, but only one of them is active at the time. And you can manage that with either virtual machines or with the cluster rules manager. And you can have a large number of satellites. And then you have a client API library and a client command line interface. And you have lots of drivers that plug into that. And you can use it for open stack, collectors, open level out box box, all those environments. If the controller uh, fails, uh, the, the storage keeps working because yeah. the load is still. Exactly. So what's interesting and what's interesting in comparison to other products, uh, many other software defined storage products, is that we have complete separation of the data plane from the control plane. In most systems, when your software, basically your management software fails, then you can't access your data. And that's somewhat different with Linstore and DVD because the two products are capable of running in isolation. Um, obviously, the satellites, when you're using DVD, will have to have DVD available, but the controller actually doesn't. The controller is not dependent on DVD. You can run the controller on the Mac if you want. That actually works. Um, you can mix those systems more or less, so it doesn't really um, need DVD. And Linstore also on the satellite does not, not need to be online for DVD to work. So even if you lose, for whatever reason, a uh, Linstore satellite instance, the applications that need the actual storage still keep running. DVD is still doing I.O. and data read requests, the data, data write requests, even though Linstore is not active. It's also nice maintenance-wise, because if you just want to update LinStore but not the DVD kernel module, you don't have to stop any resources. You can just shut down all the LinStore software, keep your virtual machines and containers and databases or whatever you're running on top of DVD. You can keep all of those running while you're upgrading LinStore. So you just delete LinStore from the system, install a new version on your system. You can even install rollback install an old version if the new one doesn't work for whatever reason. You can do all those things without interrupting your applications. What happens if uh, the uh, OpenStack or Kubernetes uh, asks to move uh, a VM to a normal location? And, uh... that's, that's the point where you need in storage. So you can run with your current setup, it continues I.O., but obviously you don't have control over managing the yeah. so like you can't create the new resource, you can't delete the resource, you can't, you can't move them around. That's what you need Linstore for. It's just your your existing setup doesn't stop working. So obviously if you if you also want to move them around and create new ones, then you'll have to start Linstore again. The, the, the programs of us, Linstore uh, should be smart enough that if they get not a uh, positive reaction back from the Linstore API that it, it hasn't been moved and the state is yeah. the same. Exactly, yeah. That's what it does. Um, data placement. So that's, that's one additional Linstore feature. You can let Linstore place resources automatically and you can place constraints on where resources are placed. Uh, and Linstore will then, for example, select a certain site or select a certain rack and you can tell it to place resources in the same rack. You can tell it to avoid a certain rack where a copy of the resource is already or a copy of another resource is. So there are constraints that you can add. Um, you can work with multiple network paths. So different resources can use different networks. You might want to have one prioritized network for important resources that is really fast. That may be your archive resource that doesn't need to be fast is on another network that is a lot slower and cheaper to run. So you can have multiple network cards managed by Linstore. As I already mentioned, there are a lot of connectors. 
So you can plug in storm to Kubernetes, either with the flexible and external provisioning plugins or with the new uh, container uh, storage interface, VSI. Um, you can use it with OpenStack, plug it into Cinder, have OpenStack automatically create storage using the store. And you can also plug it into Nebula or Proxmox virtualization environments. And recently also into Xenzor or XCPNG, which is more or less a fork of Xenzor. Our own wise what we're doing now is we are generalizing the instruction that it does not only deal with DMD resources because I just showed you that it can manage DMD resources just nicely but uh, the future is that we'll also be able to do completely different stacks with the store. Um, uh, and there's a fun story about Linston WinDMD one day uh, the developer of WinDMD walks up to me and says, hey, the Linster satellite works quite well on, on Windows managing Windows users, except for the fact that there is no MVM, so it doesn't really do anything yet, but I can start it, nice work. And I was like, okay, that's interesting, because it didn't change anything yet. So apparently it runs on Windows. I, I don't know how he did that, I could never try it, but apparently it already works. We were we were actually going to make some adjustments to make it work and we didn't tell him to start testing, but he did, apparently, so. <laughs> you migrate from Azure to uh, OpenNet. Possibly, yeah, from Azure to OpenNet or the other way around, uh, whichever direction you want. Or use both of them on different nodes. Both that should be possible. So what we had so far was a uh, typical set of DVD storage nodes and then a node that has a client or the hyperconverged setup if you prefer that where you have local storage on the application node and now what's new in WinStore is that you also get something like this a setup where you still have redundant data but you only make it redundant locally below your application you have a RAID system that uses NVMe devices remotely using NVMe auto fabrics and the actual NVMe targets are two different servers holding a part of the data for example mirror if it's RAID 1 it could also be RAID 5 and then it's erasure coded on different servers that do not really know about this setup so the NVMe doesn't really care about that but uh, Linstore manages so that the NVMe targets are allocated the NVMe initiators are configured, con configured and started and once you have them available on the target node you put the RAID 1 or RAID 5 or RAID 6 on top of that and then you run the application on top of that virtual RAID That's typically for OpenStack or OpenNet and OpenNet setups um, some message machines use something like that and um, that's basically the same thing just without the RAID you just use remotely uh, remotely managed NVMe storage and you use NVMe Google Fabrics to access it FMR storage is one um, use for that on um, Kubernetes and obviously you can also do the type of conversion so in that case Link Store becomes basically just a local resource manager so it can not only do anything that has to do with remote resources and connected resources that are there is a storage node and you're using it somewhere else you can also just use it to automatically create LVM modules or CFS modules and there's also a new application um, and obviously the interesting fact is that you can layer all those things so you can, Linster for example, you can tell it to uh, create an encryption layer looks de-encrypt on top of an LVM volume or you can tell it to integrate a deduplication layer you don't have to set up everything manually you just configure Linster to use CFS as a base then put a deduplication layer on top then put an encryption layer on top of that and then there's my application so that's the idea, that's where we are going now with Linster there's one big case study with Intel so that sounds kind of funny because we're a 30-35 people company but one of our customers is Intel 
they are a bit larger than us. <laughs> but they still will use our products uh, in very large projects. One minute left. Uh, I think that will fit in. <laughs> we will hold coffee break for questions. <laughs> very good. So that's called interact scale design. It's designed to enable scaling by basically adding racks of servers to your configuration. So since you're adding whole racks, you can imagine that those setups are really large. And what's below it used to be the story uh, configuring DLD more or less as an initiated target configuration, as a replacement for ISCASI more or less. And now it's moving to using link store for NVMe or the fabrics. So that's our basically a prestige project for links of NVMe or fabrics with Intel. And I think I'm pretty good on time. Because that's, that's more or less, I'm done. I have one more thing. Since I landed in Amsterdam, greetings to Andrew S. Tannenbaum. Uh, I read about him on your, on your homepage, and I'm a big proponent of microkernel operating systems. So that's why I know about him. <laughs> <laughs>